Welcome to this uh, scripture and ministry interview with Dr. Richard Mao of Fuller Theological Seminary. Uh, we are here to talk with him today. My name is Owen Strand, and this is Pastor Steve Farish. Uh, we're of the Henry Center, and uh, we're so thankful, Dr. Mao, that you're with us. Thank you for speaking in our series, and, and welcome. Great to be with you. Thank you. Yeah. Pastor Steve, you want to kick us off? Sure, Owen. Dr. Mao, we are thankful for your talk yesterday, and my first question really comes out of the talk, and it's at the a more personal level. You spoke about being an evangelical pietist and referenced that your own background is pietistic. I wonder if you'd be willing to tell the viewers about um, your, your background. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my dad, uh, born into a Christian home, but uh, his mother died when he was like five years old. And so the kids were farmed out to other families. Uh, in foster homes, and he lived with a non-Christian family, and so mm. my father really didn't come to faith uh, in his earliest years. And around the age of uh, 20, he was saved through the ministry of uh, the Star of Hope Mission in Patterson, New Jersey, which was the Stam family. A lot of us uh, know the story of John and Betty Stam, the missionaries who were martyred in China. And it was Jake Stam, who was a very prominent uh, Christian layman, uh, with the uh, Pocket Testament League and organizations like that who uh, led my father to Christ. And so my dad uh, immediately became uh, a worker at the Star of Hope Mission, and he would preach on street corners and rescue missions and uh, would go to uh, psychiatric uh, hospitals and what we used to call mental institutions and uh, retirement homes, prison ministry. And uh, uh, as a part of his staff training, was thoroughly immersed in the Schofield Reference Bible uh, and very baptistic in his uh, thinking. But he met my mother, who was Dutch Reformed, from a kind of very pious strain of the uh, Dutch Calvinist community. And uh, uh, they had to negotiate whether I would be baptized as a baby uh, when, when, when I was born. Uh, and in fact, my father uh, sat in the uh, congregation while my mother stood alone at the font uh, and uh, presented me. But after a couple of years, he moved over more toward her theological perspective and uh, uh, eventually became a minister in the Reformed Church in America. Uh, but he uh, did a lot of his studying part time and went to a, I, I won't tell you which, but a, a very liberal seminary. And so even though he was trained in a liberal seminary and had picked up enough Reformed theology in order to be uh, received into the ministry in the Reformed Church, uh, he pretty much kept his uh, fundamentalist, uh, uh, fundamentalist uh, connections and even some of his Schofield Reference Bible uh, uh, teachings. And so as a kid, I was very involved in uh, uh, a group called High School Born Again, High BA, and uh, I worked uh, one. Uh, I worked for three summers in a row as a high school student in a at a Bible conference sponsored by Carl McIntyre's uh, organization. Uh, so I, I have pretty good credentials in in that area. A lot of other members of my family went to uh, Moody Bible Institute, and uh, so I, uh, I I I feel like I was thoroughly immersed in the. Uh, pietist, uh, fundamentalist world where we were constantly told that we needed to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And that was a very important part of my spiritual formation, and I still claim it today. Mm -hmm. I, uh, even though I, uh, in my college studies, I rather quickly became a Calvinist, uh, very much influenced by the kind of theology at uh, Westminster Theological Seminary. I was a devotee of Cornelius Van Til's theology. Uh, I did go to Houghton College. And, married a, a woman who had been raised in the Wesleyan Church, and so I, I have a little bit of Wesleyan revivalism in me as well. Now, it's very interesting uh, to many of us who follow your academic career. You have, you know, high-level credentials, University of Chicago, President of Fuller, et cetera, other things, uh, and yet you are one who advocates for uh, owning and embracing your, your pietistic roots. And, and is calling, you're, you're one who calls other evangelicals to do the same thing. How do you balance in your own life, and how have you balanced over the years training at a place like Chicago uh, <laughs> with the Sawdust Trail, <laughs> which you've written about? Yeah. Well, I, I, in my book on the Sawdust Trail, I, I, I talk about the fact that the, uh, 
I was teaching at Calvin College and had to drive back to uh, Chicago from Grand Rapids to uh, for my final oral exam for my PhD in the philosophy department at Chicago. And I got there plenty of time. Uh, and so I sat in a coffee shop and all of those voices from my past uh, were speaking to me and saying, you've compromised with the world. Uh, you've uh, hidden your, 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 your faith in order to uh, get these credentials. Uh, and uh, the devil, you, you've made your pact with the devil. <laughs> and I got to say, I, I, I constantly struggle uh, with that. But uh, it's been very helpful to me to, uh, to find models of people uh, from the past, at least, who uh, have a strong uh, personal piety mm. and at the same time were committed to uh, the most careful kind of thinking. Mm. And uh, I've mentioned a couple of those in my my lecture yesterday, right. but a lot of my friends, people like George Morrison and Mark Knoll and others, and many of my colleagues at Fuller Seminary. Uh, I think uh, the last 20 or 30 years has been a time when many of us in the evangelical world have really worked at uh, preserving the best of what we have received, while at the same time trying to open up uh, Bible-believing Christians uh, to the broader questions of really wrestling with the important intellectual challenges, and also with the call to uh, serve the Lord in the broader reaches of public life. You spoke yesterday at length about the heart. And by the term the heart, you don't mean simply the seat of the emotions. You mean more than that. And I wonder if for our viewers, this will be recapitulation. You could speak briefly about what you mean about the heart, but then go a little bit beyond where you went yesterday and tell us how you see the mind and the heart working together and which one has to come first. Does doctrine come before a warm heart toward the Lord? Does a warm heart come first or do they come together? Yeah. Thank you. That's a, that's a wonderful question that I continue to struggle with, so I'll, mm -hmm. I'll struggle sure. to give a good answer <laughs> to it today. No, I, I really think that uh, biblically speaking, uh, the, the center of the human person is the heart. Uh, that term gets used. You know, it's the heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But uh, when we are made right with God, our hearts uh, show forth the, the glory of God and praise to God. So in some profound sense, the, the heart is at the very center of things. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, Abraham Kuyper, in one of his... Uh, meditations uh, likens the human person and and i found out that he was really drawing on a lot of medieval spirituality in the lowlands uh mm -hmm. in, in using this image a very common thing in the in the medieval period that the the human person uh, is parallel to the uh, the three parts of the tabernacle in the old testament that there's the outer court and that's the part of us that are public selves we're interacting with strangers, with people that we really don't know very well, going about our work, the uh, checkout line at the supermarket and, and the voting booth and that kind of thing. And then there's the uh, the holy place. And that's where the people are, are, are moving toward uh, uh, something more intimate. But it's it's that area, Abraham Kuyper says, where we're interacting with others who are w with whom we have intimate relationships, very close friends, lovers, spouses, uh, and then he says, uh, "There's the there's the holy of holies, and and that's where the soul is along uh, alone with her God. Uh, that's where the psalmist, for example, says, uh, "O Lord, search me and know me and see if there be any wicked way in me." It's that inner place that we don't even know ourselves. Calvin says at the beginning of the Institutes that uh, uh, the knowledge of God and knowledge of self are intimately intertwined, and that. Uh, we don't really know ourselves unless we see ourselves in the mirror of God's law. You know? And so that's the most intimate of places that, that, that we really don't know very well. And, and, you know, Freud and others have told us a lot about the, the complexity of that, that most inner being. But for the Christian, that's the place where we, we, we come before the face of God and say, Lord, search me and know me and test my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. And uh, theologically, in terms of theological anthropology, I see the heart as the as as a, a directional thing. That is, it's either turned toward God or away from God. Mm -hmm. And this is why I believe, in the most fundamental sense, we're created for covenantal relationships with a, a covenant with God, 
that also has a covenantal dimension with our relationship with other people and also with the non-human uh, creation. And if that fundamental trusting area, that, that, that place where we direct our lives, where in the most profound sense we what we're worshiping, what we're attempting to glorify, and we're created to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Uh, but if that gets distorted, then everything else gets distorted. And uh, as a Calvinist, I believe that uh, we can't really, on our own, turn our wills toward God, but that God has to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, enter into that most inner being and begin to, to redirect our lives toward Him by a gracious operation. And so uh, it's it's that directional thing, and then and then the mind is is uh, an instrument of the heart. It is not the heart, but it's uh, the mind is is that thinking part of ourselves that either is directed toward the glory of God, or is directed toward rebellion against God. And so uh, the mind is not neutral. Rationality is not neutral, but it's a it's like a weapon, and uh, we're either using it to serve the the cause of righteousness, or we're serving the the cause of, of rebellion, which doesn't mean that every thought that comes out of uh, the unregenerate heart is a wicked thought or a God-displeasing thought. But it does mean that in the most basic sense, if our, if our thinking is not directed toward the service of God, then uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of distortions and a lot of confusions. And if our thinking begins to be directed by hearts that are turned toward God, then our, 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 our thoughts can begin to glorify God and to enjoy Him even with our minds. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to be said about sure. that, but that's... Uh... Sure. Did you want to follow up? Matt? Well, I do have a follow-up sure. question, yes. if that's okay. You referenced in the lecture yesterday the, the famous um, account of John Wesley's conversion where he speaks of his heart being strangely warmed. And uh, I want to use that that picture of a warm heart yeah. to describe not just an experience of conversion, but the whole of the Christian life having a heart warm toward God. And I wonder, we, we think of you as a, an evangelical leader, as a, um, but, but you're also a Christian, yeah. walking day to day with yeah. the Lord, and you've spoken about the heart and about this pietistic tradition. So I wondered how it is that you cultivate in your own life, under the grace of God, mm. how you cultivate in your own life a warm heart toward God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you. That's uh, another thing that I really struggle with. I mean, I, you know, I've got all the same struggles as, as anyone else on, on that kind of thing. Uh, you know, I, I, I do think that in the evangelical world, we have begun to learn a lot about spiritual practices, the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines. And I've learned a lot from Father Henry now and from the Benedictines and from Eastern Orthodox people. Uh, I, uh, I do think that, that we have often had a kind of impoverished uh, range of, uh, of cultivating that. And that the, uh, you know, many of us in the evangelical tradition we're raised to have our quiet time in the morning but we weren't always sure what to do with the quiet time either and so we need we need a lot of help in a, a, a discipline of that um but i i also i for me uh i i, I talked about my love of hymns but uh, uh a lot of times my de my devotional life is on the way to work in the morning i i, I sing hymns uh how great thou art and uh uh, my hope is built on nothing less, and uh, Jesus paid it all. I mean, it, it, to me, uh, the poetry of the church, my, my distinguished predecessor, David Allen Hubbard, always said that uh, when we lose the hymns, we lose the, the poetic memory of the church. He says that a lot of, a lot of hymns uh, are congealed theology. Uh, you take a line like, uh, this is his example, um, his oath, his covenant, his blood supports me in the whelming flood. There are a couple centuries of theology packed into those two lines, wow. you know. And so uh, the the uh, the collected poetry of the past, and and I find that especially in people like Isaac Watts, and Fanny Crosby, and 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 others, uh, I find just given my history and my pilgrimage, it nurtures my soul and it.